Welcome to the full year results presentation for NWF Group. This is for the year ending May 2020. My name is Richard Whiting, I'm the Chief Executive of the group, and I'm joined by Chris Belsham, our Group Finance Director. In our presentation, I'll be taking you through the operating highlights, then Chris will give us a detailed financial review, and then I'll come back to talk about our strategic development plans. NWF, as you recall, is a specialist distributor of fuel, food, and feed. In the presentation, I'd like to highlight some of the key achievements we've had in the year. In fuels, we completed three acquisitions in the last 12 months in a fragmented market. In food, the significant expansion of the new crew warehouse that you saw in the video. And in feeds, we launched the NWF Training Academy in 2019, which is training future nutritionists in the UK. Then we move on to the results themselves. I'm very pleased it's a very strong set of results, and these are ahead of market expectations. First of all, revenue up 2.4% to 687.5 million, and that's higher activity levels in each of the three divisions, offset by lower commodity prices, that's the price of oil, and also the commodities in our feed business. The key number that I always focus on is the headline profit before tax number on the top right hand side. So you can see up 36% to a record 13.2 million pounds of profit. Equally as important as profit is always cash. And I'm very pleased to report that we converted that higher level of profit into cash. Our cash conversion rate was 113% in the year. So what you can see is our net debt level was 12.3 million, lower than expectations, and that's at 0.7 times headline EBITDA. And that's the same level of leverage that we had last year, still a comfortable level of debt for the group. Finally, on this page, just highlight the dividend. So we're recommending uh, an increase in the total dividend for the year by 4.5% to 6.9 pence. And that's eight consecutive years that we've increased the dividend by a similar amount. But then move on to talk about COVID-19 and the response and impact. I think the key thing to remember is we're very much supplying basic products to the UK economy. You know, we're feeding and fueling the nation. So all of our employees were classified as key workers. All our operations were fully operational during the whole period. And I'm very proud of the response of all of our people and all of our teams across the business who absolutely went the extra mile in terms of delivering products and services during this difficult period. As I say, all our operations were open. Um, all our staff were practical, were working from home. And also importantly, we didn't utilize any government support and we didn't furlough any employees. And we took this decision in early March. And that really has set us up for the position we are today. In terms of what happened, the impact of lockdown, um, in our food business, this is delivering ambient groceries to the supermarkets. Um, initially, there was a huge uh, peak of demand, an unprecedented increase in demand as everyone bought more UHC milk, pasta, tuna and the like, which was going through our warehouses. Um, that then stabilized and calmed down, and it's now running at a slightly higher than normal level, um, and our stock levels have returned to normal level. In fuels, there was a significant increase in demand for heating oil, that's as everyone went to working at home and living at home, um, people needed um, heating oil to heat their homes. And we delivered 37% more deliveries in the March to May period than we did in the prior year. Um, the commercial volumes obviously dropped as businesses stopped operating. And I'm pleased to report those are now coming back on stream. And finally, in fees, the volume was broadly stable. Um, there was some concern about food service outlets closing, the likes of Costa Coffee. Um, and there could have been an impact on milk prices, but the volume of feed through the period has been robust. And now we're out of a hard lockdown, we've returned to very much normal levels. So if I now turn to the operating highlights in the businesses, and I will start with fuels, where we really had an outstanding performance and also continued the strategic development of the business. Prior to lockdown, so to the end of February, um, as we reported a half year, this division was trading ahead of expectations and ahead of prior years. So that, that was positive. Intentionally in our commercial sales, we'd increased our share of gas oil. Um, so gas oil is red diesel, and that's a higher margin than the road diesel that we supply. So that was positive. And we also increased our heating oil sales, both from acquisitions and as a consequence then of the increased consumer demand during lockdown. There was also a significant volatility of the oil price, which obviously we're all aware of. And what I've done is actually put the oil price on the chart there on the right hand side. And what you can see, it was tracking, and this is Brent crude dollars per barrel, tracking at about 60, 65 dollars a barrel, really till sort of the end of February. And then Russia and Saudi um, had a fallout in OPEC as to 
uh, what quota level they were going to operate to, and the price collapsed. You can see it dropped down to just over $20 a barrel, then it recovered and then dropped again. And in that period, we were able to pass on lower prices to all of our fuel customers, but also we retained improved margins. Uh, and that has given us some one-off gains, which Chris will come on to talk about in a little bit more detail. We also continued with our acquisition program, a key strategy for the group. And you can see we added three businesses, Ribble and Caldo in the northwest of England, and Darch in the southwest down in Somerset and Devon. And that added on an annualized basis another 120 million liters to our fuel business, or 20%. And please report the acquisitions have been effectively integrated and have been performing very well. So on the right hand side, you can see the key metrics for the division. So volumes up over 20%. And most of that volume growth was as a consequence of acquisitions and then that outstanding profit performance of 11 million. If I now move on to food, um, here we had a very solid performance and a significant investment. So the underlying business that we have here was trading ahead of prior year. And maybe if I just drop down to the, the profit number you can see at the bottom line, you can see operating profits of 1.4 million. Now we highlighted um, at the half year that we're investing half a million pounds in our new crew warehouse. So if I add back that half million of startup costs, you can see we were trading ahead of prior year. That was both before lockdown and also as a consequence of that period as well. If you remember back to September last year, we had a peak level of demand because of concerns around Brexit. And in some ways that helped our business as a bit of a trial run through the excessive demand that we found during COVID. Um, in terms of overall activity levels, they're up 4%. In terms of pallet storage, you can see 3% higher. We increased our e-fulfillment operations, still quite small, but we now have got 10 customers in there, and we've got greater volumes and new customers coming in each month. And in terms of the crew warehouse investment, um, it's a 240,000 square foot warehouse that we've taken on a 12-year lease lined up to customer contracts, which are long-term in nature. And it adds 35,000 pallet spaces to our business. Um, as we said, the lease was commenced in February, and a real commendation to both the team in Bowie and also the contractors who actually installed all that racking during lockdown. And it was critical that we were able to get that extra food into there to increase our supplies to the supermarkets. Um, it was completed by the end of May, and it was also within that half million budget, and also within the 1.9 million of CapEx that we'd established as a budget at the start of the process. So pleasingly, we now have a bigger food business, 35% larger, up to 135,000 pallet spaces. And finally, in this section on feeds, I'm very pleased that we've got market share gains and we also launched our Feeds Academy. So in terms of volume, you can see our volumes are up to 625,000 tons. That's a record for the business and up 6% on prior year. And that is organic growth. And we've achieved that growth by selling more products direct to farm, more products to feed merchants, and also more products to other compounders. So that's um, increased our market penetration, but it's critically a time when the market actually itself for ruminant feed was 6% down according to DEFRA stats and hence that significant increase in market share. It's also a year when we made an investment and this is the NWF Training Academy. So you saw some of the team on the video, we actually launched this in September uh, and we've now got 18 people going through an 18 month training program in that academy covering all aspects of feed nutrition, farm management, uh, and also sales skills. And that training program has carried on during lockdown. Obviously, it's gone to remote and Zoom learning, uh, but still been very positive. Um, in terms of the business, we were impacted by higher energy costs, and that's principally electricity costs in the year. And commodity costs did increase in the second half, and particularly they spiked during lockdown. Um, and that did apply some pressure onto margins. In terms of the market conditions overall, the milk price was reasonably stable at 27 pence per litre. Milk production down a tad, 0.8%. Um, and as I said, the feed market down 6%. Um, and this business has now returned to very more normal levels through the summer months. I'll now hand over to Chris, who's going to take us through the financial review. Thank you, Richard, and good morning, everyone. I'll now take you through the financial highlights of 2020, starting with the income statement. So revenue increased by only 16.2 million or 2.4% in the year, but that really reflects the impact of two large opposing impacts. So firstly, we had just over 60 million of increased revenue from M&A and increased activity. 
but that was offset significantly by a 45 million reduction from lower commodity prices and particularly that lower oil price in the final quarter of the year. Now Richard's already referred to the, the margin benefits we achieved and you can see that in our headline operating profit which increased to 14.3 million from 10.2 million last year and that's all as a result of that outperformance in fuels. And you probably see that best if you look at the table at the bottom of the chart. So this will be familiar to many of you where we talk about our EBIT pence per litre. So how much money do we, EBIT do we make for each litre of fuel that we sell? And typically we're trying to aim for one pence per litre. And you can see back in 2018 when we had the beast from the east and all those weather events, we achieved 1.3 pence and made a lot of extra profit as a result. Well, in FY20, it was 1.6 pence. So we had 0.6 pence of um, extra one-off profit that we made as a result of that oil price fall. And if you do the maths, that equates to about 4 million of additional profit. Exceptional costs in the year, uh, just related to deal costs, so half a million. Uh, those were all cash in the year, uh, mostly not tax allowable. And that gives us a statutory operating profit of 13.5 million. It's probably worth just picking up at this point on the impact of IFRS 16 on the income statement. Uh, so in common with many businesses, we've um, converted to IFRS 16 this year using the simplified transition method, which means we don't have to restate comparatives. So the impact on this year's numbers is that um, our operating profit is 0.2 million higher. We'll have 0.4 million of finance costs going in and therefore our headline PBT is 0.2 million lower. And that's as a result of swapping out 6 million of operating lease charges for 5.8 million of IFRS 16 depreciation plus the 400,000 of, of IFRS 16 interest that I just mentioned. So if we then turn on to the lower half of the income statement, you can see in the finance cost the impact of IFRS 16, so that 400,000. In terms of real bank interest, that was up by 0.2 million in the year, and that's reflecting the investment we made in the acquisitions and also in, in the crew warehouse. And that gives us a headline PBT of 13.2 million versus 9.7 million last year. Our tax rate in the year is high, and that's as a result of the government reversing uh, the proposed reduction to corporation tax. So it was supposed to go down to 17%. As you know, the Chancellor in March maintained that at 19%. And that meant there was an increase in our deferred tax liability. So we have a one-off charge of half a million in the year in respect of that movement in terms of the deferred tax. Our underlying corporation tax rate uh, before exceptionals is 20.8%, which is in line with previous years. And as you know, we tend to guide that our tax rate should be about 1% to 2% above the statutory rate. So in line with that, and that's what we'd expect going forward. This is very much a, a one-off charge in the year. That gives us a strong headline EPS of 20.3 pence. And that gives the board the, the confidence in continuing our policy of increasing the dividend with a 4.5% increase this year to 6.9 pence, which is 2.9 times cover. Moving on to the balance sheet, fixed assets increased in the year, um, largely as a result of IFRS 16. So you can see the right of use assets of just over 27 million coming in, but also with the acquisitions that we've done on our investment in the crew warehouse. As we went into lockdown in March, we did clamp down on non-essential capex, given the uncertainty and the, and the desire to just have control of our cash. So we probably underspent capex in the year by about half to a million pounds. I don't think we'll have catch up in the current financial year. I think in reality that expenditure has just moved out to the right. So going forward, I'd expect our underlying level of, of CapEx to be about a million pounds below normal depreciation, i.e. excluding IFRS 16 depreciation. Our working capital reduced um, slightly in the year by 1.4 million. That was partly due to commodities, but also because if you, if you cast your mind back to last year end, we'd had a short term outflow as a result of the date the year end fell on and our suppliers taking direct debits a little bit early in the fuels business that clearly reversed in the current financial year. So we've not done anything different around working capital. However, it is very pleasing given the economic conditions that actually we haven't seen a deterioration in that. 
net debt and pension I'll come back to on later slides. So the, the net effect of this is that our balance sheet has strengthened once again, total assets up to 178.4 million and net assets of 51.1 million. And despite that increase in assets, because of that extra profit we've made, our return on capital employed has increased to 16.7%, driven by that performance in fuels. Now, clearly, given there is one-off profit benefits in fuels, the return on capital employed will drop back down a bit uh, where, as we drop back down to normal levels of profitability, but still very strong return we're making from our capital employed. It's also worth pointing out in respect to food, uh, that return is suppressed by the fact that we incurred half a million of uh, setup costs for crew in the year and also invested in the assets there. If you strip that out, the underlying return on capital employed for the food division is 7%, which is in line with last year. Moving on to the pension deficit, they tracked lower actually through most of the year, but the movement in the discount rate in the last few months with, with COVID-19 has increased the liabilities, so the discount rate down to 1.65%. Our next triennial valuation is to December 19. So the work on that is already well progressed and should complete in the first half of the current financial year. Our expectation is that the deficit will be slightly lower than it was at the valuation at December 16, which was 19.1 million. And therefore, our recovery payments are likely to remain at 1.8 million for the next couple of years. So at that level, it is not a constraint on group development. And then moving on to the cash flow. And one of the things I'm really most pleased about this year is the fact that the extra profit we made in the final quarter was converted into cash. So you can see that in the fact that working capital actually reduced a little bit. And our cash from operating activities in the year was 16.1 million versus 6.4 million last year, which is a conversion rate of 112.6%. So really, really good. And given that economic uncertainty, we were able to convert that profit into cash. Uh, this statement is slightly confused by FRS 16 here. So clearly that impacts the May 20 results, but isn't in the comparatives. But just to help you a bit with that, so our headline EBITDA in the year um, i.e. old-fashioned EBITDA is 18.7 million versus 14.3 million last year. We did have significant development expenditure in the year, so we spent 9.1 million on M&A transactions, and those transactions generated headline EBIT of 2.3 million. So if you do the maths, that's just under a four times multiple. Clearly, we had some one-off gains in the year in those businesses, so I'm not promising that we'll continue to buy businesses for four times, um, but just shows that the acquisitions we've done have um, given a good return in the year. We also invested 1.9 million in the warehouse at Crew, And finally, we also bought some land adjacent to our site at Wardle uh, for 1.1 million. Um, and as I've already referenced, we did underspend by about half to a million pounds on underlying CapEx in the final quarter. So there's guidance going forwards. As I said, I'd, I would assume that CapEx is somewhere between half a million to a million below uh, non-IFRS 16 depreciation. And you can see that movement in net debt on the bridge on the right hand side. So normally I would guide that we would generate about two to three million of free cash flow, i.e. cash generated before development expenditure. And that's assuming a normal level of capex and, and neutral working capital. This year we generated 9.6 million. Um, that's partly because of that working capital benefit partly the differential between uh, depreciation and capex, but really it's just that impact of that extra four million of profit flowing through into cash. So as a result, despite that, that significant development expenditure, our net debt is still low and we still have significant headroom in our facilities. And our facilities are the same as last year. We've not amended those as a result of COVID-19, although clearly we continue to talk through to the bank and stay close to the bank throughout that period. So 65 million of facilities. Uh, the most significant element of that is a 50 million invoice discounting line, 1.25% uh, over base. Uh, the one thing we did do in response to COVID-19 was we actually drew down our RCF facility so that we were in control of their own cash. So that's why that's fully drawn down at May 20 year end, uh, whereas last year end it was um, 
there was far less drawn down. Uh, the covenants in respect to those banking facilities are very standard, and we've got lots and lots of headroom on those. And clearly, as you'll see from the RNS, we've done a, an awful lot of going concern work around testing those. Um, so plenty of headroom and a good platform for development. And at that point, I'll hand back to Richard. Okay, thank you, Chris. So now we're going to talk about the development strategy that we have. Uh, just a few key things to remember about NWF. First of all, we have a diversified source of earnings. So the three groups reduce risk to the overall performance, and we generate cash, as Chris just talked about. We've got an experienced, capable board, and I think the, the critical thing for the group is we operate in these large, basic markets. It is feeding and fueling the country, and those markets don't reduce during a COVID crisis or in a financial crisis that we saw some years ago. So there's real robustness and solidity to the group. We focus on total shareholder return, and we've got a very strong track record. In each of the three divisions, and I'll come into these in some detail on fuels, but fuels is about consolidating a highly fragmented market. In our food division, it's all about optimizing the customer mix um, and clearly in the short term, utilizing the additional capacity we've got in crew, which we've got customer contracts for. We will expand that business further back by retailer and uh, manufacturer contracts. And we're also looking to expand our niche businesses of e-fulfillment and pallet line. And in feeds, remember, we are number two in the market, feeding one in six dairy cows in Britain. And we're looking to utilize and increase the utilization of our national operating platform. So increase feed sales across the country. Clearly, we've now got the academy members coming through, and those will start to increase volumes further. But we also have the opportunity to sell more products and services to the 4,500 farming customers that we supply up and down the UK. Now, turning on to fuels in a little bit more detail, I'll start with the fuel market. And if you see the bar chart at the bottom left, that's BP's latest forecast for global energy demand. So you can see it's increasing significantly through to the end of this period, which is 2040. The red bars in the bottom highlight the forecast demand for oil over the period. So you can see oil is relatively stable. The growth in energy demand has to be taken up with more renewable energy and also nuclear and other sources. This is the global energy demand market. If you look at the UK, it's similar. So critically, the demand for oil in the key markets in which we serve over the next 20 years is forecast by the UK government to be stable. We then move to the right-hand chart. That shows the market shares of the various players in the 35 billion litre market, which is the market that we operate in. You can see we're the red slice, which is uh, the third largest player, and our market share is only 2%. Now, it has doubled over the last 10 years, but it's still small. And that big gray area, 76% are others. There's over 150 smaller businesses in there, and those are businesses that we can look to consolidate and grow our business. Try to do some maths in the third bullet point to help you scale the opportunity that we face. Um, if we say it's a 35 billion litre market, on an average, let's say people make half a pence per litre net profit. And you remember, we're looking to target around a penny. But if you stay, bear with me at half a pence per litre net profit, that says the market will generate 175 million pounds of EBIT per annum. If you wanted to target 10% of the market using the six times multiple that we're targeting, that would require funding of over 100 million pounds. That's not saying we're going to look for that sort of funding, but it's highlighting the scale of the opportunity, and that would only get you a 10% market share. So demand for oil is stable. Um, and also importantly, customers buy from local fuel depots. We've seen that really strongly during the last few months. And expanding the network is therefore key to our growth. The next slide, this shows the, the map of where our businesses are today. And we're operating um, across Great Britain. So in uh, England, Wales, and Scotland is an opportunity. Um, in the last 12 months, you can see the depots that we've added, which is Darch, Caldo, and Ribble. And we've now got a, an expanding national network. Uh, we paid 9.1 million pounds for businesses that we've acquired in the last 12 months um, and that's the sort of guide going forward that's the sort of level of expenditure we believe we can replicate for a number of years going forward we've got a clear post acquisition integration plan we want to retain the brand and the customer facing operations and then integrate the back office operations things like purchasing it finance and credit control and the bar chart at the bottom left shows you our track record 10 years ago, just over 300 million liters. We've just reported a full year result of 650 million liters. 
And if I take that on a full year run rate basis, that's now 700 million liters. So you can see that quite significant expansion, which we believe can continue. I'm not gonna just hand back to Chris, who's gonna take us through some of the acquisition process. Thanks, Richard. Uh, there's four key areas I'd like to highlight around this. And the first is that we have very clear criteria for M&A. So we're looking to acquire fuel distribution businesses in mainland UK, that's it. We want to stick to what our core business is in the fuel sector. We're looking for businesses that have a good local reputation or brand, and also for businesses that have a strong domestic or commercial gas oil customer base, because those are both a stickier customer base and also a more profitable customer base because of the products that's being sold for them. Ideally, we're looking for targets that have some potential for margin increase or cost savings, but our, our deal case isn't predicated on that. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, we're looking for businesses that we can buy at six times NWF EBIT. And when I say NWF EBIT, I mean the profit that we think we will make from that business. But when we're calculating that, we're very prudent about that. We don't assume we'll have any significant cost savings or volume growth. So there's just where there's a little bit of opportunity for, for margin accretion. The second key area to highlight is that we have a standard M&A process. So we've now done five transactions since starting this strategy um, less than two years ago. That M&A process is led by um, the group PLC team who all have M&A experience, supported by the fuels management team. We say use the same legal, financial, and environmental due diligence providers. So we have standard reports, uh, they understand our approach to issues. So we've got quite a slick way at now of going in and looking at those issues. Um, but our operational and commercial due diligence we do in house because we know more about running fuel businesses than external advisors do. And then from actually the legal perspective of doing the deal, we now have standard deal documents. So that increases the efficiency around the process of doing that. And it's once you've done several deals, you realize it's the same issue on every single transaction. So we have the same approaches to those. The third key area to highlight is our integration process. So we have a standardized detailed integration plan. And as Richard said, our aim is to maintain the front end, the commercial bit of the business that the customer sees, because that's what's made that acquired business successful in the first place. But at the same time, centralize the back office functions. So centralize finance, credit control, IT, and also make sure that the business is operating in line with our operational and health and safety and compliance standards. And the fourth key point I'd like to make about the acquisition process is the pipeline of opportunities. So we are both being approached by people who want to sell their business and we're going out and proactively knocking on doors. And we have a significant uh, number of companies in that pipeline. Just before we went into lockdown, we had a number of live conversations. We paused those uh, due the, through the lockdown period, but we're now starting to reinitiate those conversations. And some of those people are coming back to us. Um, in terms of whether COVID will drive more or less activity, I think it might persuade a, a few people who were thinking of selling anyway that actually now is as good a time as any to, to do it. But I think the underlying dynamics of that which were driving the market opportunity will remain the same, which is a lot of these businesses that are owned by people who are close to retirement age and are looking to make a capital gain. So with that pipeline there, we're confident that we can continue uh, to undertake transactions at a similar rate to that we've done over the last couple of years, and therefore we're looking to invest around uh, 10 million a year in two to four transactions per annum. Last couple of slides now, and first of all, just the NWF proposition, really to highlight what we're all about here. This whole thing is about we're solid, robust, reliable, uh, but we're also ambitious to develop and grow as a business. Um, so first of all, we've got a strong management team uh, with a good track record including three acquisitions in the last 12 months. But there are growth opportunities, um, and clearly we've got a, a clear development plan and strategy, which I've outlined this morning. We've got asset backing, gross assets of 178 million pounds, which helps Chris and me sleep at night, but also gives us that very cost-effective source of funding you saw on the banking slide. We focus on return on capital, so 16.7%, very strong return on capital in the results this morning. 
and we also generate cash and you can see that very strong cash conversion of 113 percent in the year as a consequence of all of that we look to deliver shareholder return by increasing the dividend so finally uh, what we believe we have at NWF is a very strong platform for further development the results we have today are very good and they're outperforming expectations but equally importantly we've highlighted the delivery of strategy with the fuels acquisitions the significant expansion of our food business and the launch of the feeds training academy we've also demonstrated resilience where we've got a strong balance sheet with long-term funding we were fully operational during lockdown and we didn't utilize any government support um, we're now into the new year so two months have been completed on police report we're trading in line with the board's expectations in fuels uh, we're not expecting any repetition of the one-off gains we saw in 2020 uh, and we're trading in line with what we'd expect um, in this part of the summer in food we're building up stock in our new warehouse um, as at this morning in our crew warehouse we have 25,000 pallet spaces utilized and in the total food business 123,000 pallet spaces and that stockhold is increasing fast so we're absolutely delivering in line with our plan there and in feeds please report demand and pricing are both stable in these key summer months so finally we've got confidence in the future developments and the outlook for the group We've got a strong operational and financial base, and now critically, we're the focus is returning to development and acquisition investment opportunities. So thanks for listening to the presentation. I'm now gonna hand over to Tamsin, who's gonna host a Q&A session. Thanks. And margaret Crow from Edison. We're just unmuting you now. Go ahead and ask your question, Anne margaret Good morning. Um, thank you for taking my call, and congratulations on a terrific set of results. Um, I've got a couple of questions um, on the feeds side. Um, the first one was you mentioned an, um, your goal of selling more products and services um, to farmers and wondering if you could elaborate on that um, and in, in, in particular sort of what percentage um, of your offer at the moment would fall into the category of I don't know, enhanced products or services. Um, and then secondly, um, I can see that you're very rapidly um, expanding market share in feeds, but was wondering if that was at the expense of margins um, and if, it, if that was the case, what the rationale for that was. Okay, thanks, Anne, and good, good to have you on the call. Um, two, two, two questions there. The first one in terms of selling other products so feed is the majority of what we sell um, a key thing we're looking to sell it are more what we call traded products so these could be things like um, um, additional health products um, it could be uh, supplements and vitamins milk powder and this type of product um, and our market share in those areas is a lot lower so if we sell feed to one in six uh, dairy cows in britain that's a market share of 16%. In some of these other product areas, we'll only have a market share of one or 2%. And there's a big opportunity to increase the penetration there. So it would be less than 10% of our total business today. That is an opportunity for growth because they are our customers. Um, to that extent, we've increased our telesales team in Wardle, and we've also launched the ability for customers to buy these products online through our website. So those are a couple of ways we're looking to do it. And we've also utilized a number of our academy members whilst we've been in lockdown to prospect for new business in that area. So it's an opportunity to increase our share quite significantly with additional products and services to our customers. Um, in terms of the second question, have we sold more volume uh, because we've um, sold it cheaply? The answer to that is, is no. Um, very much at the half year, as you saw there, um, our volumes and margins were robust. We've grown market share by selling on nutritional benefits to farmers dairy farmers in particular up and down the country. Um, our margins did get squeezed, but that was as a consequence of commodity cost increases, particularly which spiked uh, during coronavirus. So no, we're very pleased with the volume that we've grown. Um, it's good business, which is sustainable uh, and long-term. We have a question from Peter Ashworth at Stockdale Securities. Go ahead and ask your question. Uh, well done, guys, a tremendous performance. Is the competition falling away? in the various sectors. I mean, you've done well in difficult markets and you've done well during the pandemic and fuels is an exceptional performance. Is, are you just better at it or is the competition falling away? That was just my general sentiment. Thank you. 
Okay, th thanks, Peter. Inter interesting question. Um, competition is always, always tough out there. Um, maybe if you use fuels as an example, I think early days we took the decision as a group not to uh, furlough any staff, so we were fully operational. Um, I know in the fuel business, a number of our competitors actually did park up tankers and furlough staff. So when customers wanted to get supplies of oil, um, they were struggling to do that. So they came to us because we were fully operational uh, and open, and therefore, um, that will have gained us some market share. Whether that's sustainable into future years, we'll need to see, uh, but that certainly helped. I think in the feed side, we've been really consistent in terms of what we're trying to do as a business. Uh, we've got real stability in the leadership team of our feeds business and in that sales team there. And that really helps build confidence amongst the sales team. And also, we're investing in that business. So, you know, the training academy, whilst it's recruited 18 people, is also given some real pride to all the nutritionists up and down the country because they see there's a real future in, in this business. And we've got good feedback from both the agricultural colleges and also from industry bodies on our training course. So I think that builds up some pride in the business, which helps. Um, and I think on the food business, it's been interesting. Uh, Keith, who's my uh, managing director in the food business, has actually had a lot of feedback from customers um, latterly during lockdown. And actually, what he's realized is how much his business is valued by our food customers. You know, clearly, Keith and the whole team in Bow have gone the extra mile in terms of supplying that additional demand. Um, and it, it's, it's really highlighted how valued we are. Now, that won't necessarily be sustained for the long term, uh, but that's shown that we've got a very solid business with a good management team that's well regarded. Uh, and clearly, we continue to grow. Um, the crew facility is, is full with customer contracts that we have. And we're now looking to see how effective and efficient that can be as to whether further expansion could follow because there are more customers who are looking to come on board. And the people who've gone into crew, have you shared that with us? I haven't had a chance to read everything. Uh, no, it's um, a number of customers have gone into crew, um, people involved in the breakfast cereal business and the sweet business with whom we have long-term contracts, uh, but I haven't quite got their permission to, to mention who they no. are, but uh, mm -hmm. they, they love being in there. And now we have a question from Andrew Ford at Peel Hunt. Andrew, go ahead and ask your question. Well done again on, on the results today. Um, I've just got a couple of questions, um, both on so one on the feed. Um, I wondered if you could give us uh, an idea of how you see uh, feed moving uh, into into the next sort of 12 months, whether um, sort of, uh, suppliers, uh, sort of producers of feed are having a uh, a good time with the weather that we're currently having um, and how you see that sort of materialising or if they're struggling to kind of, um, farms are struggling to kind of grow the right amount, grow the right crops. Um, the, the other question comes on food. Obviously, uh, the move to online is, is looks like it's going to be a sticky one. I just uh, wonder what the churn is like uh, on your customers. Obviously, the demand has been good, but, but have the customers that you've, that you've acquired, have they been fairly sticky? Um, yeah, hopefully those make sense. Okay, that, thanks, Andrew. Just, so to cover off those, first of all, in terms of feed, Chris and I always have a, a debate here about how quickly the grass grows. And my view is it grows the same amount every year. It's just everyone gets excited when it's dry and it doesn't grow and then it's wet like today and it starts to grow. Um, so the feed market itself is really just big and stable. It's just under 5 million tonnes per annum. That's for, for ruminant animal feed. Um, going forward, uh, we see that market as being reasonably stable, certainly in terms of, of dairy demand. Um, demand from consumers for dairy products is pretty much linked to the population, um, so that's growing slightly. And therefore, we see demand for feed for the next 12 months as being reasonably stable. Um, as with all our businesses, actually, if we're going to grow, it's actions and initiatives that we need to take as a business. It isn't the market itself which, which is going to help us. So I think we see the market as big and stable, and I think that's probably where most of our peers would see it as well. So it's, it's a reasonably good place to be. Um, in terms of food, um, just a couple of points to come back on you there, Andrew. The first one in terms of the move to online. Um, moving to online doesn't have a negative impact on our business. All it may mean is a different delivery point for our food product. So remember, we're holding the, the bulk stock for all the food manufacturers and importers. So if, for example, Amazon increases its business, we're shipping more to Milton Keynes and to the Amazon distribution centers, um, if Tesco increases their business, we're shipping more to Tesco distribution centers. And if Tesco goes more online, it goes through that same supply chain. So the move to online itself doesn't have an impact on our business. It potentially brings some new entrants in and broadens that, that delivery base, which can be positive. In terms of the customers in our e-fulfillment business, uh, in e-commerce, uh, those are typically existing customers. 
Uh, so a customer that's just started taking use of our facility is Lavazza, um, who's been a customer of ours for over 10 years and with whom we have a three-year contract. So they've started um, doing uh, e-fulfillment with us now. They hold their bulk stock with us, so it's a natural extension of their business to get that done there. Um, and we haven't actually lost any e-fulfillment customers since we started some 18 months ago. Uh, but it is a relatively small part of our business today. Akhil Patel from Shawcap asks, what's the rationale behind the land purchase across from the Wardle site? Yeah, so the, the land's actually adjoining um, our existing site. Um, they are building um, or are, are well progressed in building an industrial estate around our site. Um, and what it will enable us to do is to have a second access point onto our site um, because there's going to be a connecting road through the industrial estate. So the rationale for buying that was it actually gives us more flexibility as to the layout of our own site and creates a potential second access point onto our site, which enables us to have more efficient uh, movement of vehicles around the Wardle site. And that's the end of the questions. Richard, do you have any closing remarks? I think the only thing to say is um, very proud of all the people in NWF, the extra efforts that they went through during lockdown. Um, it really was tremendous. We've now got over 30% of our people working at home um, and they're gonna stay there keeping safe uh, going forward. And I think it's a year which has really demonstrated the resilience of NWF. I'm positive that we've got a good set of results, we've converted into cash and that we're paying a dividend. And very much now it is about strategy, it is about growth and it is about investment. Um, and we see those opportunities coming up and are looking to develop the group further in the next 12 months.